The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Market Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Filling in for Tommy O'Brien. Let's uh, figure out what we got going on here. How y'all doing this morning? It is 58 and sunny in Florida, which is awesome. We're gonna get some camping trips in here. Listen to some Stan Rogers or something like that. Let's look at what we're doing right now. All right, we're on the court, straight fundamentals right now. We're up, we're up in everything. We're up 0.93% uh, before the open. The Russell futures up 1.37%, NQ up 1.32%. Uh, Dow futures up 0.67%. Gold at 19.98. Still looking for above. We topped right there about 2020. Still looking for something going up from there. Silver at 2314 and copper at uh, $3.68 on the contract. Tesla, we're up about 4% pre market. Steel Dynamics still trading in this bounds. I don't know. I need to hop in when we retrace back here. I think I'm going to do that. The dollar. Hoo, hoo, hoo. We finally cracked it. We're at 105.88. Don't know if we're having some issues right now with uh, the stream. Can't see the screen. Can anyone in the den tell me what's going on with this? Do you guys see anything? Hey, hey we'll, we'll run it anyways. All right, so what's the big news? What's letting this rally go on, okay? So basically, Yellen was saying they're going to spend, or excuse me, sell 776 billions in bonds, okay? This is lower than what they had announced, which is $852 billion prior. Okay. This somewhat suggests that we might have a stabilization in rates, at least in the tenure. Okay. This is very positive. This essentially kind of sends the market green. Okay. So rates have topped in theory. Um, and this brings essentially less selling pressure in the bond market. This is very positive. All right. Give us a second here. I think we are uh, working on some technical difficulties here. All right, we'll take a look over here. We'll get into Palantir. They had uh, pretty solid earnings. So let's take a look here. Projects uh, price revenue above estimates on demand for AI platform. They are trading about 17% up, which is pretty uh, solid. This is obviously on a year to date, um, but we're looking right around here. Um, this is a big move up. They've also been supplying um, just general AI uh, for kind of warfare solutions. And um, there's another company called Anduril that um, does similar things. That's run by Lucky Palmer. And uh, what they're doing is supplying uh, kind of tech out to uh, Border Patrol agents. So this is massive. So this kind of security solutions and AI is really blowing up. Um, data analytics firm Palantir Technologies forecast fourth quarter revenue above market estimates on Thursday, uh, betting on strong demand for its new artificial intelligence platform from clients, including U.S. government agencies. Uh, we've spoken about them in the past. Uh, Palantir expects revenue between $599 million and $603 million, uh, the midpoint of which was above analyst estimates of $600 million. A positive sign of the future. Uh, demand for its new platform, the company said it was seeing strong interest in AI boot camps uh, that it had launched in October to give clients access for one to five days. The company revenue rose 17% to $558 million in the third quarter, slightly above estimates. Uh, revenue from government clients, key source of sales, grew 12% uh, below Wall Street expectations and the 15% growth recorded in the previous uh, quarter. Budgeting constraints at the government level has sparked some near-term uncertainty in the business, but Palantir remains positive on demand in light of geopolitical tensions. And that is a massive thing because their solutions are kind of used in, uh, I say warfare, but we can also say security, right? Maybe it's not outright warfare, but, um, you know, intelligence gathering and stuff like that uh, is not so direct. Um, these guys uh, will win with this. Still trading about 1745 on a share. 
was really good a few years ago. I hopped on, a, there was a rally on, I don't know how long ago this was. Yeah, it was right around here. I think we went above, I can take a look here. Uh, can't get my charts to go any further out. We traded about like $41 on the thing. I bought in around 30 and it popped up there. And luckily I got out quickly. Um, but the problem was a lot of people didn't and it shot down and uh, we're trading now at 1743. I, th I like this stock. It's very interesting. Um, and I think AI being used in kind of security solutions is definitely uh, the forefront and going to uh, increase. We have a news article here. We'll take a look. Uber and Lyft are paying $328 million to settle wage theft allegations in New York State. They agreed to pay a combined $328 million to settle allegations the ride-hailing companies unlawfully withheld wages from drivers and failed to provide mandatory paid sick leave in New York State. Uh, Uber will pay $290 million, while Lyft will pay about $38 million. Uh, the money will go to drivers affected by the company's alleged practices. Uh, more than 100,000 drivers in New York could be eligible to receive the funds and benefits secured under the agreements, James' office said. Drivers will be notified by mail. And this is such a rough, like, gig to be in. I had some friends who were doing, especially DoorDash, and we'll talk about them because they're, um, they had increased sales this quarter, which is pretty intense. Um, I did not expect that, especially as I think a lot of people are not ordering out as much. So I, I wonder if some of these larger cities are really driving DoorDash. I know there's a major culture in Manhattan around it, and I saw that a lot when I was there, and a lot of people I spoke to when I was kind of prodding on that um, – are still using DoorDash, but uh, you know, the workers for these companies, um, the, it, it's a tough space for them. You know, um, if they don't get tipped, they don't make a lot of money. If they are sick, uh, as we see in this kind of article here, um, it's really rough for them. It, you know, because in theory, at least you know, we talk, look at Uber and Lyft. They're not really they work for the company, but it's much more of a contract idea, right? Now, obviously, they are employed, right? Um, but they're using. The idea was that these workers would access Uber and Lyft's um, kind of marketplace in order to drive, right? It's not like a taxi company. So this says for years that Uber and Lyft systematically, uh, excuse me, systemically cheated their drivers out of hundreds of millions of dollars in pay and benefits while workers long hours, excuse me, while they work long hours in challenging conditions. It's interesting. So we're seeing kind of a shift uh, in trying to get these companies in this kind of new economy uh, that we are running. Take a look here. We can go into Starbucks. They had a massive uh, increase as well. They're up 11%, which is uh, pretty good for them. Take a look here. We'll go on the month. A huge green bar up there. Uh, trading from about the low here, at least on this bar, 91.38. Before this breakout, about the same level, uh, hovering just under 92. Uh, we're trading at 101.60 now before the open. Uh, U.S. consumers are still waiting to splurge on all their stuff here. This is massive. These guys are huge for the holidays with their pumpkin spice and chai lattes. Um, and they've just maintained dominance, even in a uh, situation and in a world where people are really trying to support smaller uh, breweries. These larger cities, they love Starbucks. It's easy, they're everywhere, and the product is consistent. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. We'll get these technical difficulties sorted out in the break. And uh, we'll see you soon. Stay right there. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years 
years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. And he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back. We are we are on YouTube now. We got the streaming going wrong. We got to get going. This is positive. You can see my mug now this morning. Um, before we left, this is for the YouTube folks. Uh, we were talking about Starbucks. All right. So they beat uh, estimates. Essentially, they're up ten point six one percent. Okay. And the big driver for this is that American consumers were still willing willing to pay uh, higher costs for their premium seasonal beverages. That, that meme for the pumpkin spice is strong. Same store sales were up 8% in the US with the uh, kind of introduction of the seasonal beverages. There's a lot of promotional activities, they, they popped it up. Obviously the culture itself sells it to everyone with all the memes on pumpkin spice. International same store sales also jumped 5%. It's a little bit less than was expected. Um, China same store sales were up 5% and that beat estimates. Um, and there was, there was a lot of companies actually that have tried to beat Starbucks, right? Maybe I'll talk about that. Uh, I'm going to be filling in tomorrow as well. And we can go in a little bit. Um, I think it was called like Lucky Rabbit or something like that. But they had an attempt to try to beat out Starbucks. And uh, they were engaged in not great activities in order to do so. And it fell through as well. Uh, even though foot traffic increased 8%, people ordered less as the average ticket size fell 3%. That is in China. Starbucks has invested more in international business over the years. It recently announced its 20,000th location outside of North America and plans to expand 9,000 stores in China. That is a large amount. So anyways, that is what we got popping before the open today. So Barrett Gold. Now this is good stuff here. Now give me one second. I'm trying to pull everything up. That is right. I think our ticker for that is gold, if I remember correctly. From the gold report, if you're not subscribed, subscribe into that. We're up 1.19 right now. Uh, Barrick Gold beat analyst expectations for third quarter profit on Thursday. The Canadian gold miner benefited from lower costs, increased production, and higher bullion prices. Again, the gold contract is trading at about 1995. Toronto-based company uh, posted adjusted earnings of 24 cents per share for the quarter ended in September 30th, while analysts on average had expected 20 cents. Average prices of gold during this quarter rose 11.4% uh, from earlier this year, uh, with Barrick's average realized gold prices rising uh, 19.28 per ounce from 17.22. We take a look here. We really did have a nice runoff in gold, right? We get this from 1889, popped up to our high right now, at least of the year of 2019. 
Cold production in the third quarter was higher sequentially on higher production, and uh, it's still looking good for the gold bugs here. Of course, we're having a little bit of a pull down here from the top, um, but we might get a consolidation kind of going on. We're talking a little bit, oh, I didn't bring this up yet, ah, ha ha. All right, let's say quickly here. Now this is in Europe, so it doesn't always affect us so much, but this company is being sued at least by some states in the US. This is Meta, okay? Now, the states of the U.S. are suing Meta uh, because of Instagram's kind of predatory uh, content cultivation concept. Wow, that's a lot of, got a little bit of a uh, assonance right there, alliteration rather. European privacy officials are also hitting on them as well. So Meta basically has behavioral advertising where it pulls in data from its users and uh, basically tries to sell them things based on that, right? So they're putting kind of the kibosh on that. They've widened the band on the behavioral advertising practices to most of Europe on Wednesday, setting up broader conflict between the con uh, continent's privacy conscious institutions and an American technology giant. I still think that this culture is growing in the US uh, where people don't want this overall, right? So falling into that, you know, we had the lawsuit that finished out with Uber and Lyft, right, of predatory practices. You're getting Meta smacked down on some of that as well. We have Attorney General, at least in Washington, D.C., they're suing real page and residential landlords. They're saying for rental price fixing, illegally raising thousands of districts' residents' rents. Of course, you had that lawsuit. I think it was out in Kansas, um, who got at the owners of MLS. I think that's the NAR. Um, and then obviously Zillow and Redfin got hit on that as well um, for kind of uh, working together to increase um, some kind of fees. So now this is expanding into just straight landlords in general. Uh, the defendant landlords are some of the largest providers of multifamily housing in the district. This is in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the Office of the Attorney General's investigation revealed that RealPage's technology was used to set rents for more than 50,000 apartments across D.C., this is pretty intense. Page offers a variety of technology-based services to real estate owners and property managers, including revenue management products. So it'll be interesting to see this kind of spread out in the country if we do get that. I think uh, there is a case to be made in a lot of areas uh, that this is happening as well in other spots. Let's go back in here. Second to pull up what I want to pull up. Perfect. In the saga of Disney, essentially, right, we're going to move over to them now, okay? They've had quite a fall from grace. Uh, they're increasing prices to their park to try to kind of offset uh, this major L that they've taken this entire year. And now they're moving in to essentially buy out Comcast and take full control of Hulu. This is an $8.61 billion deal. Um, has not moved much at all, at least pre-market on this news, um, which is not something that uh, I like to see as someone who holds Disney. Um, they're buying the rest of Hulu from Comcast, It'll acquire 33% of Hulu Comcast, uh, excuse me, 33% of Hulu that Comcast still controls and expects to pay NBC Universal approximately 8.61 billion for it. Uh, Bob Iger, Iger said when he announced the combined streaming app that it's a logical progression of the company's direct to consumer offerings, and that will provide greater opportunities for advertisers while giving bundle subscribers access to more robust and streamlined content. You know, I think that there's a bit, and you know, Bob Iger really presided over Disney after a, a massive kind of run-up for it, right? And they brought him back in to try to straighten out the company. I think that they're seeing issues in streaming already with Disney+, Plus. okay, so that's one thing. You're buying not necessarily a competitor, but a something in the same kind of industry you're in. I, I think that Disney, you, you know, this might pay off for them, but but I worry that they're kind of losing, you know, what they're meant to be doing, right? Which is they have this brand, which is pulling out phenomenal movies that everyone loves. They're big blockbusters. Obviously, they acquired Star Wars, which is positive for them revenue-wise, at least in the beginning. They've had to shut down... Um, some parts of their Star Wars park, okay? And uh, less people are going to their, or had been historically going to their park. So they're lowering, excuse me, they're increasing the prices as that surge comes back uh, post-pandemic, okay? 
Now we're seeing them try to get into something else, which is Hulu. Now they already own a large majority of it for a while. And I don't know if that's the right way to necessarily go. That's a lot of money going out. Maybe they're kind of standardizing some cash flows and that might be positive for the company going forward. But that see that more as a stabilization factor than something that's gonna bring Disney back up uh, to higher prices, right? And so I'm kind of sitting here stuck with all these shares at a cost basis that's still below here, but you know, when you're when you're talking about you had a company that was uh, you know above 100 for so long, and now we're sitting at 8170, you know it's not a great look. Um, and so the Hulu thing is not something that I'm as a stake as a stockholder super excited over. And we'll see what other people think too. I think they think the same because we're not moving a lot on Disney. Um, folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you ready to take your trading to the next level? Introducing Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, your key to successful active trading. Tom O'Brien, renowned for his expertise in the financial markets, has designed Market Insights to be your daily guide to profitable trades. Tom publishes his daily Market Insights newsletter every market day before the market open, along with updates when warranted. Stay ahead of the game with Tom's real-time analysis and trade recommendations delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a seasoned trader or just starting out, Market Insights provides the edge you need to navigate the markets with confidence. Ready to join the ranks of successful traders? Head over to TFNN.com and subscribe to Market Insights today. Don't miss out on this opportunity to supercharge your trading results. Market Insights comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for all new subscribers, so you have nothing to risk. Don't miss out on this opportunity to revolutionize your trading game. Head over to TFNN.com right now to join the thousands of traders who have already experienced the power of Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, firsthand. TFNN, educating investors. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. You're at the market open right now. Let's see the ES futures up almost a percent. Russell futures up 1.5, NQ's up 1.23, Dow futures up 0.64, the gold contract moving down a little bit. We're at 1993. Let's take a look at Tesla real quick. They're up 3%, 3.5%, which is pretty decent for them. They had a nice little pull down here. Uh, there were some issues at least trying to get uh, the Cybertruck out. I think something that's important to note here is just kind of how long, how far ahead Tesla is 
in producing these EVs. They're able to sell them at cheaper prices than these other competitors that are trying to break in. I'm interested in Volkswagen uh, because they are trying out a cheaper EV out in Europe that has not hit American markets. If they can make that profitable there for a cheap cost, uh, they may be, um, I wouldn't say a full-on competitor with Tesla, uh, but someone that could make them kind of make some more moves, right? We take a look at other companies that are trying to break into the EV market, and uh, we're talking about Ford in particular, right? And so what Ford is doing is they're trying to essentially reel back in the production of uh, some of their plants, okay? Ford had proposed a $12 billion EV factory in Kentucky. Uh, it was basically going to be building, assembling some of the cars, but also focusing on building the batteries, okay? They're postponing this, right? They're not backing off on producing the EVs per se, but they're backing off on expansion of it in the meantime. I think Tesla just has such a run ahead of all these companies uh, that they kind of have streamlined production for it. Ford's EV business continues to lose money. This is around $1.3 billion this past quarter in adjusted earnings. So far this year, uh, Ford has lost uh, about $3.1 billion on its EV spending and said it's going to lose a total of $4 billion the next year. The Kentucky plant, which is a mega campus that builds the lithium-ion batteries for electric cars, is going to be put on hold. Uh, Ford's not alone in all of this. General Motors is pushing back production of its new uh, slate of electric trucks and SUVs. Tesla CEO Elon Musk spent a large chunk of his last earning calls moaning about interest rates. Customers would probably agree most of the early adopters have adopted, and the next tier of possible customers has enough sticker uh, shock to keep their wallets closed. Now, I think what would be massive, and we've seen this in the UK at least, but sales for essentially used EVs has actually jumped 81%. So we might see a lot of the consumers coming into EV on the secondhand market, right? This is not really a big thing for the producers themselves because they're not really getting that, that kind of pay right there. It's the secondhand sellers who are. So if we look at it that way, you're going to have a longer time frame for these Companies that are trying to break into EV who have made, you know, classic, uh, you know, traditional cars with combustion engines um, that, uh, that are essentially going to lag in seeing a lot of purchasing of their newer cars, right? So we might be out a few years from that. Ford reached a tentative agreement with the United Auto Workers last night, being the first of the big three U.S. automakers to get a deal. The strike cost them around $1.3 billion, and the company pulled back. Uh, its guidance for 2023 based on that. I also think that, I still think that Tesla's on the front of it. They're going to be selling this kind of data as they go forward for autonomous driving. We're seeing more autonom autonomous vehicles popping up in larger cities, and that's going to kind of pad uh, the loss that Tesla might uh, get from decreased new EV sales. So, and I still think, too, that the government is pushing this in a major way. Um, there's obviously still a massive tax credit you can get for buying these EV vehicles, and they are dumping in a lot of money, at least the White House is, uh, for hydrogen production plants. Um, this is for renewable uh, energy in general, not necessarily EV. That's still going to be, uh, you know, you, you can charge the batteries, I guess, with this kind of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the government is trying to push for taking relays uh, to charge a lot of these vehicles. And I think the minute we get to that, um, you're going to start seeing a lot of consumers who I think still find like the kind of curb appeal of EVs. It's still there, right? It's just so expensive. And especially kind of in an era where I, I, I think that, you know, things, people aren't spending as much for that. And we've seen that too um, with people just missing car payments in general. I think that's rough for a lot of folks that are getting there. Obviously, that's not a great sign for the economy itself. There's a record number of subprime borrowers behind the auto loan payments uh, by more than 60 days. A uh, rate hit 6.11% in September, and obviously that's just the base, so you can go up from there depending on your credit, which is pretty rough. Um, you know, I had friends who were paying 15%, 20% uh, APR on their vehicle, which is pretty nuts, and we might see more defaults with that. The analysts predict that the auto loan delinquencies will continue to rise in 2024, peak at about 10% before they start to fall. High rates of delinquencies indicate uh, that many lower-earning workers in particular are struggling amid ongoing high inflation, 
a rough jobs market, and a resumption of federal student loan payments following the pandemic era freeze. So you have this kind of confluence of like positive and negative events uh, for vehicles in general, EV vehicles as well, um, that kind of might indicate a uh, slowing acquisition of new EV vehicles in the market in general, right? I don't think Tesla gets hit that hard by it. They still get hit, but you definitely see Ford and Dodge and Jeep and everyone trying to get in to this EV spot. Uh, they get hit pretty hard uh, from that. All right. We can take a look at Airbnb. They have done okay. They've lowered for, uh, the fourth quarter guidance, sadly, uh, but they earned $4.4 billion in the third quarter, and this is due to tax breaks and higher than expected revenue. Uh, they still did well regardless of the tax breaks. We'll take a look at that in general. Uh, Wednesday, it said it earned $4.37 billion in the third quarter as it booked a large tax benefit and posted higher than expected earnings. Uh, revenue rose 18%, to $3.4 billion. Uh, and the, what's important to note as well is they said that excluding the tax benefit, the net income would have been uh, $1.6 billion which is uh, up from 1.2 the year prior. So they still did well, but these kind of positive earnings were magnified because of the tax break. Um, the company saw a 14% increase in bookings, and that's really what we're looking at. So as more people are interacting with it, it's again, not just because of the tax break. And slightly higher average prices for short-term rentals. Uh, analysts expect the San Francisco company to post revenue of 3.37 billion, according to a fact sec survey. Airbnb predicted fourth quarter revenues between 2.13 billion and 2.17, and I still see it. And again, you know, when, when I talk about what I see other people doing, I, I have a kind of a large array of um, different people that I interact with, um, all different socioeconomic levels and just different backgrounds. And so that's why I know they're anecdotal, but when I say I don't see people using them as much, I, I think I have an okay sample size. Now, obviously I'm in, still in St. Petersburg, Florida, so that's a unique spot in general economically speaking, and definitely culturally as well. Uh, but why am I saying all this? Because I, I still see people, even though things are, are tough for a lot of people that I know, I'm still seeing them spend money on getting Airbnbs, go on trips. Now, maybe the trips are, uh, you know, you don't spend as much. I, I see a lot of people my age, I'm 27 and a little bit younger, and probably on the other side of that as well. You go on these trips, your, your largest cash outflow for this is going to be Airbnb, okay? Finding a place to stay, and then you do normal stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money. You hike, you go look at animals, um, maybe you go to a nice dinner every now and then, but I still see Airbnb being very strong and a lot of people my age still spending money to get there pretty frequently. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. Tires. Every Tuesday and Thursday, Tim Orr joins the Tom O'Brien Show to share his unique insight that he's developed over decades of trading. Now, on Tuesday, November 7th, from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Tim Ord will be hosting his own live webinar. Tim's analysis has been outperforming market returns by almost double, and his gold analysis is on track to be a winner as well. Tim will be delving into six secret ratios that every trader should know. In this webinar, Tim will be covering the daily TLT VIX, the daily and weekly SPY VIX, the American Association of Individual Investors bull bear ratios, and the trend panic levels. Tim will break down each ratio, how it is calculated, its importance, and how it can help you make bigger returns. It's as simple as this. Learn the ratios, trade by them, and see your returns. That's it. Visit the front page of TFNN.com today to sign up now. TFNN educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com. 
educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tommy O'Brien. I will be with you tomorrow as well. Take a look here at the ES Mini up 1.16. Looking at the SPXL from our friends over at Direction. This is a leveraged ETF, bull, bull ETF uh, for the S&P 500, up about 3.5%. The dollar cracking down. Let's take a look. Where can I find it? At 105.95. Now we're moving up a little bit from the, what we were pre-open, which is about 105.80. But that's fine. This is a nice crackdown. Um, I don't see us having another fake out with it. Um, the market loves this. I think the concept that rates might be stabilizing, um, especially with the Treasury um, selling less than they had anticipated, uh, is positive, and the markets love this. And you ask, Jacob, how could I have known this is when it was going to rip off, uh, when it was going to just pop? Well, I would ask you then, have you been listening to Tom O'Brien and Tim Ord. Tim Ord is on every Tuesday and Thursday. He's going to be on today, folks. Tim went long on Friday, which was massive. If you did that, you would have made a lot of profit. I want to take a look here. Tim Ord is actually having his own webinar on November 7th. So let's take a look here. And he's going over these key levels that are telling him when he wants to go long, when he wants to go short. And kind of going out there's six secret ratios okay this is the daily tlt vix daily spy vix the weekly spx vix the daily v vix over the vix american association of individual investors bull bear ratios and trend panic levels which are phenomenal themselves i've been trying to learn as much as i can when tim is on and it's beautiful folks check this out all right this is going to be great this is going to be on november 7th from 4 to 5 30 p.m eastern time and I really recommend you checking him out today on Tom O'Brien's show. So that's what we're looking at. I might, I, I see this as a positive thing for everything. The, the environment right now is positive. I think that the market wants things to go up. I still think we have this perma bull concept. Uh, things are still relatively strong in the U.S. economy. I mean, we're seeing pretty good quarterly growth. Uh, some companies have lowered their expectations for Q4, but not all of them. And I still think we're not in a uh, major burn down situation right now. If that happens, that's going to be in the next, you know, two quarters or three quarters, especially we we're talking about with some uh, consumers defaulting on some of their loans. But as it stands now, the companies are doing all right. Speaking of companies that are doing all right, we have Roku. They have blown up themselves. Let's take a look there. Oh, man. It makes your heart hurt when you see that because you wish you were in it. Jeez, up 20% right now. Yes, yeah, so they've done pretty well. Revenue grew about 20% year over year. Man, look at that. Well, we were kicking sub 60s, and now we're above 70 right now. That is pretty intense. Of course, on the high uh, on the year today, we had 98 Active accounts also beat coming in at 75.8 million for the quarter. Roku said it experienced a rebound in video ads during the period. After the Bell Wednesday, Roku reported actually a net loss of 330 million for the third quarter, or 233 per share. The revenue was up 20%, however, year over year. It's quality over quantity here. 
uh, largely driven by strong performance in content distribution and video advertising, along with unit sales of Roku branded TVs. And that's the big thing. And I'm actually due uh, to buy uh, a new Roku stick. So maybe I'll get to uh, contribute to this a little bit. Uh, Roku branded smart TVs come pre-installed with Roku interfaces. Uh, users would experience on external plug-in Roku streaming player. Smart TV was first made available at Best Buy earlier this year and drove a device segment revenue increase of 33%. Uh, and that is pretty solid for them. I still think they're a big player in kind of that streaming device services. I don't use Roku TV per se. Um, I think Samsung really has the domination in that, uh, excuse me, the dominance in that kind of market. But, you know, you keep buying these kind of units just so you can stream Netflix or Apple or whatever. And uh, it's easy and I think, too, they did really well in the beginning, um, one with their marketing. And this is when they really first started because, you know, myself as someone who owns a Roku, and I've had this thing for, like, probably a decade now, and I really need to get a new one. But the point is, is, like, I don't want to buy anything else. I have no interest in trying out a Fire Stick or, a, you know, Apple TV or whatever. I'm going to stick with the Roku. And I think there is a lot of brand loyalty in uh, kind of streaming devices. And so I think Roku benefits from that uh, pretty solidly. Taking some more, let me get the ticker up for you. I this always eludes me, mainly because I don't trade the company. Um, and we're looking at Dash, that's right, it's just Dash. So we're up 16.13%, I mean, this is nuts. These are nuts numbers for a lot of these companies here. And I think the market is still looking for somewhere to just put their cash. DoorDash orders surged 24% in the third quarter, helping to narrow the delivery app's losses. Powered past sales and earnings expectations in the third quarter, saying a growing mix of stores and faster service is drawing customers in the U.S. and abroad. San Francisco uh, delivery-based company said that its total orders grew 24% to 543 million, and it still blows my mind that people still use DoorDash. Again, I was saying I think this is in larger cities. Uh, I do see, like, People talking online about it and like meme concepts or just uh, complaining about the company itself, but they're never going to not use it because uh, who doesn't want food just delivered directly to their door? And I think the advent of using, uh, you know, internet pay has made it easier to kind of separate you and your money. You know, we use DoorDash a lot um, during basically quarantine and it just it can double your order every time. It's unbelievable. Their their riders don't get paid that much. Excuse me, their their drivers don't get paid that much. They rely heavily on tips, which is really what drives this kind of increase in price for DoorDash. I mean, you can make something that's 15 bucks end up being $32, all things considered. Uh, but people still love it, supposedly. Uh, I mean, look at this, right? Even some of the cafes I go to, uh, people will be DoorDashing very expensive drinks. I, I can't even imagine what that cost is, um, but... I guess just it has an appeal to certain people. I, I, I don't use this company like that, just mainly because I try to watch what I spend. Um, but uh, it seems like a lot of other consumers aren't necessarily concerned with that. The revenue jumped 27% at $2.16 billion, ahead of the $2.09 billion that was expected. And obviously, we are trading 16.8% right now. The company said its monthly active users... Uh, increased at double-digit percentage rates in September, which is insane, and a strong demand from both the U.S. and international markets. Growth in order frequency also accelerated from the second quarter. And it, it makes you, like, kind of wonder what this economy looks like, like, under the mask, right? Who is out there that is able to spend so much money? I mean, a double-digit increase in monthly active users is insane, right? And maybe that might be... Uh, one-time users. It'd be interesting to know the exact data on that. But you get this conflicting analysis that some people, like, listen, we have Target, okay, and they're saying their consumer market is uh, not spending as much on groceries. They're, they're moving into something like Walmart, right, that offer cheaper groceries. Then you have something like DoorDash, which amplifies the cost of food and eating out, essentially, um, you know, by, by almost double and they're on fire right now. And I, I just, I, I wonder, there just, there just must be like these diverging classes in the U.S. And I, I think young people are the ones who are uh, the participants in this, right? Young people are the ones who are moving away from Target groceries. And young people are also the ones who are spending a ton more money on DoorDash. I, I think that having a deep kind of like, I guess, review of this or analysis might really... Uh, kind of elucidate some interesting concepts. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back for a very short break. The goal 
gold report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the US futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at tfnn.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at tfnn.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at tfnn.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Let's take a look at a Shopify on the break. We have, a, we have a short segment here. But just these, these wins are insane. This is up 19% right now on significant volume. Uh, wow. It posted the third quarter revenue in line with Wall Street estimates on Thursday as its artificial intelligence products drew more merchants to its platform. The e-commerce company said total revenue for the three months of September stood at $1.7 billion compared with analysts' of estimates of $1.67 billion. I mean, what else do you need to know about that? They're a dominant in kind of the e-commerce spot, and uh, congratulations if you were in um, this before the run-up. I mean, 19.4% is pretty intense. They were, we were talking a little bit in the den. I think Saul was bringing up some stuff about McDonald's. Let's take a look. This is just a little bit more you know, your traditional economics class here. But uh, McDonald's and Chipotle are raising menu prices in California next year as fast food wages rise to $20. Obviously, they're raising menu prices to offset the increase in minimum wage. However, the CEO of McDonald's said that the minimum wage hike could help the burger chain gain market share in California in the long term. They haven't decided how much uh, they're going to hike the prices in California as they raise 20 bucks. Um, Chipotle did say they're going to raise it by mid to high single digit percent in the state, but has not made a final decision, which is a pretty significant increase, obviously. Restaurants have been hiking menu prices for more than two years in response to rising ingredient and labor costs. Price for food away from home is up 6% in September compared to a year ago. 
according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Diners are already used to paying more for their meals. Some have been eating out less often to mind their budget. McDonald's executives said Monday that consumers making under $45,000 have been visiting less frequently, contributing to a dip in the U.S. traffic this quarter. And honestly, I mean, McDonald's is expensive now. Like, it's not your cheap, you know, let me pay a buck for a burger or anything. <laughs> you know, that's another story that will be interesting for kids who are, you know, in business school. Um, you know, they, they were having that issue with people not wanting to go for them. And it was more of the, the image, right? Nobody wanted to be unhealthy. Um, and so to try to combat that, they, they introduced a lot of new burgers or sandwiches that were like eight or nine bucks to try to be like, look, we're healthy. Nobody, nobody feels that way about your company, McDonald's. Just uh, make yourself look cool again or something. Folks, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we have a replay of Basil up next, and I'll be with you on Friday as well. Take care.